practicing the biblical principles of what a church should be and manifesting the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Hour of Faith, originating from the sanctuary of the Faith Baptist Church of Altoona, Pennsylvania, 315 40th Street in the Highland Park section of the city. As you participate in today's broadcast, may the Lord challenge your heart with the word. Welcome those of you joining us by radio, television, the World Wide Web, Facebook Live, and any other way that you might be visiting us today on our media ministries. This, of course, is the Sunday morning service coming to you from the Faith Baptist Church of Altoona, Pennsylvania, the United States of America. And we thank the Lord for the opportunity that we have to minister the Word of God to you on a regular basis. And uh, we Thank God for the Word of God that when we preach the Word of God, it brings people to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And today it is our prayer that if you don't know Christ, that you will come to know Him today. The Bible says that we've all sinned and have come short to the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved which means to be delivered from sin, its power, its penalty, and its presence through faith in Jesus Christ alone. I ask you today, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Can you say that you're on your way to heaven? If indeed the, you were to have died last night, would you be in heaven today? Well, some people say you don't know those things. Well, yes, you can know it. Because the Bible tells us that when we trust Christ as Savior, we know that we have eternal life. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's true. That's truth. That's reality. And so if you doubt your salvation, if you're not sure that you're saved, I encourage you right there uh, at home or driving down the highway or however you might be joining us. Simply say, Lord Jesus, I trust you to save me. And if you make that your prayer, contact us here at the Faith Baptist Church of Altoona. We will send you information that will help you to get started right in your Christian life. If you're watching, you can see all of our contact information there on the screen. If you're listening, you can get a hold of us through our website, which is www.fbcaltuna.org. That's www.fbcaltuna.org. Or you can call us at uh, area code 814-944-2894. That's 814-944-2894. Certainly, if we can minister to you, spiritually speaking, don't hesitate to give us a call. We would be delighted to do what we can to help you in your walk with the Lord. First, the scripture that I want to give to you today comes from the Old Testament book of the Psalms. Uh, remember, the Psalms, really, the Psalter uh, is to be sung. It was the Jewish hymn book. And uh, there is uh, a lot of good doctrinal truth in these Psalms. And I'd encourage you to take some time and, and, and read them and study them and even sing them. They're, there is a hymn book out that uh, has put the Psalms to music, and, and that's, that's a true blessing. But in Psalm 118 and verse 14, 
It says, the Lord is my strength and song and has become my salvation. Many times we preachers like to have alliterated outlines. Well, so did God. And you can see it right there. Uh, the Lord is our strength. That means that whatever strength we need for the day, He is there to give it and He is there to be it. He just doesn't give us strength. He is our strength. And then He is our song. In other words, it gives us something to sing about. And uh, when we come to Jesus Christ, it's the song of redemption, the song of praise, the song of glorifying His name for who He is. And then it says, He has become my salvation. Now that simply means deliverance. And whether we're talking about being saved from our sin through faith in Christ or just being delivered in the trials of life, God is there to deliver us. And wherever you are today, I just want to remind you that there's a God who loves you. There's a God who wants you to get to know Him. And He is the Lord of the Scriptures, who is the one who gives strength and song and salvation, deliverance to those who know Him and to those who depend upon Him. And I trust that that verse will be one that you will apply to your life today. It's a part of the Word of God. And you know, it's a blessing to hear the Word of God. And we're going to sing a song that uh, shows us our desire to hear the Word of God. It's number 359, Sing Them Over Again to Me, Wonderful Words of Life. We're going to sing that in the sanctuary here. If you know the song and you're joining us by Media Ministries, sing along with us. Number 359, Wonderful Words of Life. Let's stand as we sing. Pastor Gary has always taught us that when we sing a song, we better make sure that the words we're singing are the words we mean. And so when I decided to do this, this medley, it didn't dawn on me until this morning that there is a phrase in there that I'm not so sure I do, but it's my prayer. It starts off, I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary, that I do. And I'll believe whatever the cost. You know, that's my prayer. But when I think of Pastor Brunson and I think of those that are persecuted for the message of the cross, I want that to be my prayer, that I'll believe whatever the cost. So I'm going to sing it as my prayer 
and my endeavor to Christ to help it be real to me. That when time has surrendered and this earth is no more, that I'll still cling to the old rugged cross. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. And I believe whatever the cost for when time has surrendered and this earth is no more, I'll still cling to the old rugged cross on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame and I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. And in the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I believe in that hill called Mount Calvary. And I believe whatever the cost For when time has surrendered And this earth is no more I'll still cling to the old rugged cross Thank you, Val. That's a, a good prayer. And I pray that we will stick to the old rugged cross and its message. If you have a copy of God's Word, please turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter this morning. And I would like to read to lay the foundation of the message, verses 1 through 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Verses 1 through 18. And I invite you to stand out of respect for God and His Word as I read and you follow along. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 15. Where the Word of God says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, that is, we want you to know of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, Not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he begun, had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, 
as ye abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be, uh, may, may be a supply for their want, and their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equity, equality, as it were, excuse me. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. God always blesses his word, and we thank him for that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come to you this morning, we thank you once again for the opportunity that we've had to worship you in giving, in special music, and in singing. And now, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship you through the study and the teaching of your, your, your precious word. I pray, Lord, that as we look at this particular subject of grace giving today, that you will give us an insight and an understanding of giving to your work that perhaps we have never, ever considered before. Teach us your word through your spirit. And may we truly apply your word to our heart, that we might in all things bring glory to your name in our life. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's children said, Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. What do you think of when you hear that the preacher is going to speak on giving? Let me ask that question again. What do you think of when you hear that the preacher is going to be speaking on giving? Is that something that when you hear that, is that, and if you know that in advance, is that when you decide to go visit Aunt Sally? Although Aunt Sally has been dead for 25 years. Because you don't want to hear anything on giving as it relates to, to what the preacher has to say. I remember a number of years ago, the Lord led us to speak a six-part series of messages on giving. And one particular family left the church over it. And when I talked to them, they said, I don't mind hearing a sermon on giving once every now and then, but six sermons in a row, that's too much. Well, you know, it couldn't, I couldn't help but think... I wonder where that person's heart is. Is it not true that when you love somebody, you want to give to them? Is that reality? That, that when you love a person, you want to give to them? And it is also true that then when we love the Lord, we would want to give to Him. As a matter of fact, uh, this passage of Scripture that we read, there's a verse in there that says that giving is one of the ways to prove the sincerity of our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now sometimes when people think of giving, they think of it as an obligation. Or they think of it as a command that's been given to them. Or they think of uh, that, that perhaps it uh, is something that, that, that God expects of them. And, and consequently, they have a negative attitude toward it. But let me ask you for a moment. Did you ever think of the fact that giving is a part of God's grace upon your life? Yeah, I'll say that again. Giving is a part of God's grace upon your life. 
The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Bible tells us that it's the grace of God that teaches us how to live a godly life. But did you ever stop to think that every time the collection plate is passed, it's a part of God's grace upon your life and my life to be involved with His work? You know, if we thought of the fact that giving was an aspect of God's grace upon our lives, it might change our attitude toward it. If we think it's an obligation or an expectation or a command, and, and, and to a certain degree, it is all of those things as you read the Scripture. God does command us to give. God does want us to give. God does expect us to a certain degree to give. But when you think of the fact that giving unto the Lord is a part of God's grace upon our lives, I think that it would change our entire attitude in giving, don't you? And that is what the Word of God teaches. That is what the Word of God teaches. How do I know that? Well, look at the very first verse of the scripture that I read this morning, that we read together. It says, as Paul is speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit. That is, we want you to know, we want you to understand about the grace of God. What's that next word? Bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. You see, God gave the churches of of Macedonia, an act of grace that they might give to the work of the Lord. Giving is a grace. Giving is an act of God's grace upon us. That's why we're calling this message today, Grace Giving. Now, I think you understand the background of 2 Corinthians 8. If you don't, allow me to share it a little bit. Uh, keep in mind that due to famine that was in the land, a lot of the Jewish believers in Jerusalem, the Judea area, had uh, been impoverished. They didn't have much to live on. They didn't have much to eat. And so what the Apostle Paul was doing was encouraging some of the churches in the area to help the poor believers there at Jerusalem in the Judean area to help them out in, in their need. And so he was asking various churches to give to a special offering that the Christians in Judea might be able to eat, that their physical needs might be met. And one of the group of churches that responded was the Macedonian churches made up of Philippi, Berea, and Thessalonica. And you know the interesting thing about the Macedonian churches? They were paupers, paupers, poor. Their economy wasn't any good. And yet when you read down through this passage of Scripture, you find that the poor churches of Macedonia, Philippi, Berea, and, and Thessalonica gave to the poor Christians at Jerusalem. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? I could hear today some people say, well, I'm, I, I don't have two nickels to rub together myself. Why should I give to somebody else who has a need? Well, one of the reasons is that when we give to others who have a need, God will bless that gift. And certainly, you know, we might not be able to give a big amount. But if we can even give something to those who are in need, if we could give something to the work of the Lord, God will bless that. So what we see here is that the Corinthians, indeed, they had the ability to give a lot, but uh, they had promised that they were going to give, and yet they didn't fulfill that promise. And so Paul was saying, now listen, just think of the grace of God, how God poured a grace out upon the churches of Macedonia that they might be willing and able and gifted of God to give. To the poor people of Jerusalem. Giving is a grace of God. Giving is an act of God's grace upon your life and my life. We shouldn't think of it as an obligation. We shouldn't think of it as a command. We shouldn't think of it as, as, as something that's expected. 
But every time we have the opportunity to give to the work of the Lord, we ought to thank God for this grace that He's given to us that we might be involved with His work. There's a lot that we're going to look at as we work our way down through this particular chapter, and we may not get to it today. But I want us to think about this uh, as, we, as we begin to look at it. Did you ever hear the phrase grace giving? Perhaps you haven't. As a matter of fact, I never thought about it until I started studying for this particular uh, message, for this particular series a while ago. I never really gave it consideration until I looked at that phrase. It, isn't it interesting? Even though I'm 66 plus, every time I pick up the Bible and read it, I find something else. Moreover, brethren, we do you to understand, to know of the grace of God bestowed upon, given on the churches of Macedonia. Yes, giving unto the Lord is an act of God's grace upon us to do His will. You say, what is grace giving? Since you've never heard of it, I think it would be well for me to give you a definition. And you can see it there on the screen. If you're here in the sanctuary or watching the television, if you're listening by radio, you might want to listen carefully. And I will repeat it several times so that you can pick it up. And if you're in the sanctuary, you might want to write it down. But grace giving is the act of God upon each born again believer. How many born again believers? Which means what? Oh, it is the act of God upon each born again believer in which he, God, bestows upon the child of God the opportunity to give to the work of the Lord and thereby be used and blessed by the Lord in unimaginable ways. Now, did you ever think about that? Grace giving is the act of God upon each born again believer. In other words, this isn't upon the unsaved, this is upon the saved. God never asks or, or expects the unsaved to give to Him. God does not give them this element of His grace to give to Him. But this is something that's given to born-again believers. Grace giving is the act of God upon each born-again believer in which He, God, bestows upon the child of God the opportunity, the opportunity, say that with me, the opportunity to give to the work of the Lord and thereby be used and blessed by the Lord in unimaginable ways. Can you all see that on the screen this morning? Then let's read it together. You know, sometimes when we read it, it sort of is engrafted into our hearts. Uh, let's read it together. Perhaps you've already written it down and you can read it off of your own notes. But, but let's read it together. The grace giving is the act of God upon each born again believer in which he bestows upon the child of God the opportunity to give to the work of the Lord and thereby be used and blessed by the Lord in unimaginable ways. And you know the fact of the matter is, when we give to the Lord, God blesses us in unimaginable ways. How many of you can say amen to that? Amen. Sure you can. You've given to the Lord in a unique way. Perhaps a sacrificial way. And God blessed you in ways beyond your imagination. I want to remind you that the giving that Paul is talking about in this passage of Scripture is a financial giving. Every now and then you'll hear people say, well, you know, I, I, I give and I give my time and I give my talent. Well, and, and that's important. But in this passage, he's talking about financial giving. And, and how do we know that? Well, it's simply because of the fact that the churches of Macedonia uh, were, uh, or the churches, uh, the Christians at Judea and Jerusalem were impoverished. And so Paul was asking people to give money to help those poor Christians at Jerusalem. Financial giving is in this context. Certainly, I trust that every one of us who love the Lord will give our time and our talent. But you see, he also calls for the giving of our treasure. 
in our tithe and offerings and special gifts. And that's what this passage of Scripture is all about. I was doing some reading on this recently, and I was reading uh, uh, from Warren Wearsby. And Warren Wearsby, you know, a great Bible teacher, said that one of the things that, that has surprised him down through the years is, is that every now and then a pastor or a missionary would come to him and say, I really don't give financially to the work of the Lord because I give the Lord my time and my efforts. And, and uh, you know, he made the statement, he said, that is ridiculous to take into consideration. Who, who in the ministry would think I don't have to give tithe because I give my time and my efforts in the, in the ministry? Who would do that? Well, apparently people do. And in fact, I've heard people from time to time say to me, well, you know, I, 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 I give this to help the church out, and I give that to help the church out. I, I can't give my tithe. I, I can't give a, a, a nickel, but, but I give other things. This passage of Scripture is speaking about financial giving. It's grace giving. Grace poured upon the churches of God at Macedonia that they might help the Christians over in Jerusalem. And you know the thing that we need to take into consideration is that God does not need our giving to do His work. Did you ever think about that? God does not need our giving to do His work, but He wants to use us in doing His work. I I like what it says there in Psalm 50 and verse 2. God says, if I were hungry, I would not tell you... (laughs) For the world is mine in the fullness thereof. Think about that. You think God ever gets hungry? No. But if he did, he wouldn't come to you and say, hey, give me 25 cents. I want to go to McDonald's. By the way, that's how much a hamburger at McDonald's used to cost. I don't know what it is today, but that's what it used to be. But think of that verse. God says, if I were hungry, I would not tell you the world is mine and the fullness thereof. You see, God has everything that he needs. And so when we are talking about us giving to God, it's not that God is in trouble and needs our help. It's not that God's in a pickle and needs help. It's not that God's in a hole and wants us to pull him out of it. No, 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 no. God does not want us to give to him because he has a need. God wants us to give to him because he wants to bless us. And he gives us the grace to do that. You know, so many times we we think of grace in salvation, as I mentioned a moment ago. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But I want to just put it this way. As the grace of God enables us to overcome sin, the grace of God also allows us to be free from ourselves that thus enables us to do God's work. Now think about that. I want to say that again. It's not up on the screen, but I want to say it again for you. As the grace of God enables us to overcome sin. That's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. The grace of God also allows us to be free from ourselves and thus enables us to do God's work. When you turn to Titus 2, and we won't turn there this morning, but when you turn to Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, it teaches that not only does God's grace save us, but, but God's grace teaches us how to live godly lives. And a part of a godly life is what? Giving financially to the work of the Lord. Godly people give to God. Financially. Hmm. If godly people give to the work of the Lord financially, then we would say that ungodly people don't give to the work of the Lord, right? I mean, isn't that reasonable? Sure it is. Because one who lives a godly life is one who is living a life out of obedience and respect to God. Godly people give to the work of the Lord because God's grace teaches them to do it. 
Ungodly people don't give to the work of the Lord because they don't allow the grace of God to teach them to do it. Giving, that's grace giving. Giving, that free, or grace that frees us from ourself so that we can give unto the Lord that which he wants us to give. And in this case, financial giving. But here's the thing to take into consideration. Not only does God give us the grace, in other words, pour upon us the gift that we might give to Him, but God also gives us the substance of the gift to give to Him. He doesn't just grace us with the ability to give, but He gives us so that we can give to Him. In other words, as you can see up there on the screen, all biblical giving to the work of the Lord is grace giving because the opportunity to give comes from God Himself. 1 Chronicles 29 verse 14 says, For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. In other words, a few moments ago, we had the opportunity of taking up an offering. Who gave you the money to give to the offering plate? God. Oh, you say, I worked for it. Who gave you the job? God. Who gave you the ability to do the job? God. You say, but I'm retired and it's Social Security. Who, well, who really provided Social Security for you? Yeah, it wasn't Franklin Roosevelt. It was God. Everything that you and I have in our possession God has given it to us. And so when the offering comes, when the offering plate comes, when an opportunity to give to the work of the Lord comes, we're not giving out of our own substance. We're giving out of what God himself has given to us. Did you ever wonder why God gives us the ability to make money? Yeah, so I can go on vacations and so I can have a big retirement, so I can buy a boat, so that I can buy a boat, so that I can buy a boat. <laughs> I've taken up fishing, you know, and I'm thinking of a boat. How about it, David? God gives us the ability to make money so that we can give to Him. Therefore, when we fail to give financially to the work of the Lord, we're holding back from God that which He has given to us to give to Him. Did you ever think about that? We are talking about grace giving. God has given us the gift of giving back to Him. All things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. Now, we're going to work our way down through this 2 Corinthians 8 chapter. We're not going to get into it today much. But I want to tell you this before I forget it. That, that 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, uh, these two chapters are the most complete chapters. I should put it this way. In this passage, we have the most complete teaching on giving that the New Testament has to offer. So if you really want to understand what giving is all about from the New Testament scriptures... You need to study these two chapters. All we need to know about giving is found in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. And it's a clear lesson on grace giving. Now, are you with me so far? Amen. Giving is not just to be an obligation. Giving is not just to be uh, 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 responding to a command. Giving is God's grace poured upon us that we might in turn give financially to Him so that He as a result might use us and bless us. You know, it's true, the more we give, the more we're blessed. Can you say that? Some of you can because you've given and you've been blessed. The more you give to the Lord, the more God will use you. Can you say that? Yeah. That's the principle of giving. But I want to share with you some, some practical considerations about grace giving in the few minutes that we have left this morning. I'd encourage you to write these down and take them into consideration. Nine of them, to be exact. Number one, giving is the biblical way to be a co-laborer with God. 
Giving is the biblical way to be a co-laborer with God. You see, when we, when we give into the offering plate that comes around, we are becoming a part of God's team. The Bible tells us that we are co-laborers with Christ. And, and one of the ways to be able to do that is to give to the work of the Lord. When there's a special need, and we've had several of them around the church recently. We've had several projects around the church that some of you have given to. Praise the Lord. Those projects are getting done. We've had some people who've had needs. You've given. You know we have the fellowship fund. First Sunday of every month. That is, by the way, that's taken from uh, 2 Corinthians 8. We'll look at that later on when we get to it. The reason why we call it the fellowship fund actually comes from this passage. But it's helping others who are in need. We give on a regular basis so that we can support missions and missionaries all around the world. So you see, giving is the biblical way to become a co-laborer with God. Work alongside of God to get His work done on earth that He wishes to accomplish. Secondly, giving is the biblical way to help others in need. Giving is the biblical way to help others in need. The, the, the churches of Macedonia, paupers. We're helping others who had need down at Jerusalem. And every now and then, like I said, just last week we took up the fellowship fund. And the purpose of that fund is to help others in need. And so this is the way God uses us. It's interesting. Back in the book of uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6 and verse 38 we find a promise of God's blessing to those who give. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, it says, Give and it shall be given unto you. You know that verse, don't you? It's Luke six thirty-eight. Give and it shall be given unto you. Then it says, Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. In other words, when we give, it'll be given to us. How does God give back to us when we give? It says... Shall men give into your bosom? For with the same measure you meet with all, it shall be measured unto you. You see, when we give to the work of the Lord, even when we give to others, God promises us that He's going to give back to us. How? Sometimes through the channel, through the means of other people. There have been times when the special need came up and I reached in my wallet to, to give to that special need and, and only had like a $50 bill. That's not too often, but it has happened. And I give the $50 bill and think, oh man, I needed that. I need to go get my car washed. You can laugh at that. Before the day's done, somebody's given me $100. Yeah, hands are, heads are shaking. You, you know that. When you give, God gives back sometimes through others, mostly through others. That's how he does it. Number three, giving is the biblical way to experience the blessing of God. I'll tell you what, when we give, God blesses over and over again. I, I think of that Old Testament passage of Scripture in the book of Malachi, chapter 3. And, and, you know, that's probably one of the most well-known verses of Scripture on giving, where he says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. That is, give so that my house can do the work. Give to the church so that the church can do the work it needs to do. He says, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. How many of you have gotten so much given back to you that you couldn't contain it all because you've been giving your tithe to the work of the Lord? Blessing. Now that blessing may come in the monetary way. That blessing may come in, in physical ways. I mean, there are any numbers of ways that that blessing can come. But God has promised that when we give to Him, we will experience His blessing. Every now and then I hear people say, I just don't see God working in my life anywhere. Well, I can give you a hint. Give to Him financially and you'll see Him work. 
He's promised it, and that's been proven over and over again. Number four, giving is the biblical way to be used by God in the gospel ministry. Giving is the biblical way to be used by God in the gospel ministry. You see, when we give to the work of the Lord, then that enables us to get out the word of God. You know, as, as we mentioned last week, uh, in, in our door-to-door evangelism so far, we have been to at least, or to close, 700 homes. And you see, if, if you were involved with that, you know we had nice, attractive packets that we put together. Good information on it. It cost to print those packets. How did we print them? Because you gave towards it. And even though you might not have been out there knocking on the doors, you were a part of the work of God in giving out the gospel because you gave to that cause. Do you understand what I'm saying? Tremendous thing to take into consideration. We are all to be involved in getting out the gospel. And one of the ways of doing that is by giving. Number five. Giving is the biblical way to exemplify Christ. It's the biblical way to exemplify Christ. How many of you, how many of you would like to say today, Pastor, I really want to be like Jesus? One, two, three. Praise the Lord, yesterday when we had a funeral service here, we had a good number of people respond to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. And one fellow over here in the corner, when I gave the invitation, he put his hand up and put his hand up. And went, you know, he, he, wouldn't, he wanted to make me know that he wanted to receive Christ. So how many of you would really like to be like Jesus? Uh, now we've got six hands up. Well, whatever. One of the ways to exemplify Christ is by giving. It's interesting, and we'll look at this a little bit later on. An illustration of giving comes from this passage, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. It says, For we know that you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet uh, for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. In this context of giving, the Word of God gives us an illustration of Christ. Christ became poor that we might become rich. Christ gave sacrificially for us. And one of the ways for us to exemplify Christ is to give sacrificially back to Him. Great concept to consider. Number six. Giving is the biblical way to meet the needs of the local church. It's the biblical way to meet the needs of the local church. How do you think we pay the bill? The money tree out back, huh? You know, I've gone out and I look for that money tree. And if it's there, it's lost all its leaves. It's not there. We are able to pay the electric. We are able to pay our media ministries. We are able to, to do whatever it is because of the giving of the gifts of the people. And, and when you give, yeah, you're giving to God, but it's used to the local church so that the local church can be what it needs to be in, in the local area. Church doesn't get government subsidies. I'm glad it doesn't. We probably wouldn't get it anyway. The needs of the church are met by our giving. Number seven. Giving is the biblical way to send missionaries to the lost. Wow. It's the biblical way to send missionaries to the lost, to the world. I remember when I started out in the ministry 40, almost 45 years ago now, the average missionary took a year to a year and a half to raise support. Today they say it's closer to four years. Why? You know why? Because God calls missionary, missionaries, but the churches and the people don't give to missions to send out those missionaries the way that they should. It's as simple as that. I could give a lot of stories on that. If you want a blessing, give to the missions of the local church. Give to a missionary. 
Because you see, that's what giving does. Number eight, giving is the biblical way to show one's love for the Lord. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Aren't you glad I'm not singing this morning? Oh, how I love Jesus, but don't send me the offering plate. You may laugh at that too. No, you're not. Why? Maybe it's because how you live. You know what? If you love Jesus, you're going to be looking for ways to give to him and his work. We have a man in our congregation who has told me that more than once. That one of the reasons why he likes to come to church is so that he might find out what needs to be, he, where he can give, so that he can give something to it. He looks for ways to give to the Lord. Why? Because he loves the Lord. What about you? What about me? You say you love Jesus? What, what are you giving to him sacrificially? I'm not talking about time and talent. Now, we're talking about finances. How many of you are saying, no, I'm not coming back next week for the second part of this? I hope you all come back and bring somebody with you. This is a blessing. It's a gift that God's given you to be able to give to others. It's a biblical way to show one's love for the Lord. I love you, Jesus, but don't let me give you. Don't, don't, you, you can't have my checkbook. Dr. George Miles of the Washington Bible College used to say you can tell where a person's heart is by looking at their checkbook. Mm. Finally, giving is the biblical way to give appreciation to God for His grace. Giving is the biblical way to give appreciation to God for His grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. But Lord, please don't send the offering plate. I don't like to give to it. If I give to it, I'll not get that boat. So Lord keeps the offering plate away. Now, I don't know. We're not going to publish that song. But you see, <laughs> forgive me, but are you getting the point? How many of you love the Lord? How many of you appreciate the grace of God? Where would you be without the grace of God? I'll tell you where you'd be. You'd be on your way to hell. If it were not for the mercy of the Lord, which is the twin of God's grace, we would already be consumed. But God, through His grace, has bent over backwards to provide for us a salvation that we do not deserve. And a part of us showing appreciation for that salvation is by giving to Him monetarily. Those nine points... Giving, the biblical, giving is the biblical way to be a co-laborer with God, to help others in need, to experience the blessing of God, to be used by God in gospel ministry, to exemplify Christ, to meet the needs of the local church, to send missionaries to the lost, to show one's love for the Lord, and to give appreciation for God and for His grace. Now, if you're not saved, God does not want your giving. There are many people who think, well, if I'm unsaved, I'll give to the Lord. I, I know a fellow that I don't think he's saved and he does give to the Lord from time to time and he says, I just have to help God out every now and then. God doesn't need his help. God doesn't want his help. God doesn't want the gifts of the unsaved. But he's given you and me as the saved the great ability through his grace to give. And you know what? When we give, God will meet all of our needs. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. In verse 8. It says, read with verse 7. Every man according as he's purposed in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly. Or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. That word cheerful means hilarious. <laughs> it means to laugh. 
Wouldn't it be great if when the offering plate comes along, everybody start laughing? Oh, <laughs> just like watching Penn State <laughs> mess up. God loves a cheerful giver. But notice verse 8. And God is what? God is what? God is what? To make what? All grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound unto every good work, after you do what? Give. You might give sacrificially, but you haven't lost it. It will be given back to you again and again and again, over and over again. That's God's promise. When we give to God, God promises all of our needs will be met. Has God ever gone back on a promise? No. Trust Him. and Watch Him work. Grace giving is the act of God upon each born again believer in which He bestows upon the child of God the opportunity to give to the work of the Lord and thereby be used and blessed by God in unimaginable ways. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I would encourage you today to call upon His name and ask Him to save you. But if you are saved, are you giving? Now, the Lord willing, next week, we'll work our way down through 2 Corinthians 8. Where are you going to be now that the preacher announced he's going to be talking about giving next week? Hope you'll be here to receive a blessing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, there are six marks of grace giving that I will be sharing with you next week. We can throw them up on the screen there quickly right now. Grace giving is sacrificial. Grace giving is selfless. Grace giving is spiritual. Grace giving is sincere. Grace giving is steadfast. Grace giving is sharing. We'll look at that next week, the Lord willing. It's all from this passage of Scripture. I trust that you'll be out as we study it so that you'll learn more about this grace giving. Think of it. God has given you grace, a gift to have the ability to give to his work that he in turn might use you and bless you. Wow. Don't think of giving as, a, as, as an obligation. Or command. Think of it as a gift from God to honor Him. We'll continue this next week, the Lord willing. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to look into your word, and I pray that you'll take your word and use it in our lives today. If there's any who does not know Christ, it's my prayer they'll come to know the Lord, but for those of us who do know the Lord, may we look again at this great concept of giving in Jesus' name. Amen. 518 is our hymn. Ask the question, give of your best to the master. Are you? Let's sing it and this altar is open if you'd like to come for prayer. Number 518. welcomes you to Sunday School at 9.30, morning worship at 10.30, Sunday night service at 6, with youth programs, adult prayer and Bible study, Wednesdays at 7, with Foundations for Faith every Wednesday night during the school year. If we may ever be of any spiritual help to you, please call 814-944-2894. Log on to our website at www.fbcaltuna.org or write to the Faith Baptist Church, 31540 Street, Altoona, Pennsylvania, 16602, USA. 
I'm JT Teeter. Till the next time we meet, may the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him. Yeah, yeah.